from Safe Harbor Cambria on the California Central Coast. We make a joyful noise. <laughs> the bells have chimed and from around the world. Pitar has checked in from India and across the Central Coast in the country. Those of you on Zoom, we are all gathering in to the sanctuary hour, this holy hour on the Lord's Day. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship now as we breathe deeply, center our thoughts, and listen to the meditation played by Kate and Jack. In the name of our Lord, grace and peace, and welcome to Safe Harbor Presbyterian. Friends gathered to support each other, to serve the community in the light of Christ, to inform our faith, and to be a safe harbor of love and acceptance. And no matter where in the world or across the state of California you may be, you are welcome here. Love is spoken at Safe Harbor. We notice from our Zoom field that a lot of you are not in Cambria this weekend, that you are traveling, but thank you for checking in. And Pitar, it's good to see you in India on a Monday morning. This is the sixth Sunday of Easter, and Dr. John D'Elia is here, back from a travel, and Shelley is with him, and we're delighted when John is here. Um, this is uh, a couple of days in the Presbyterian Church that we recognize. One of those is it is a day of awareness and action for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. That is something to keep in mind and to be mindful of and, and prayerful of. It is, a, it is a problem that happens in some of our Native American communities that doesn't really reach across to the, to the larger press. Uh, it is also awareness of older adults week. That's not a problem. <laughs> of awareness here <laughs> amongst us. Uh, we also continue our days of kindness and gratitude, and we are all being larks, reading Eugenia's devotionals, asking us to do those little uh, random acts of kindness. And so we continue with that and gathering uh, thoughts of gratitude from people who have benefited from kindness. So uh, with all of that, let us begin our worship. If you would please stand. On this day, we gather beneath an empty cross. God so loved the world. God made us for love. There is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
loving God, loving Jesus, loving Spirit, the divine three in one, we come to worship and to give you all glory, praise, and honor. And now together our prayer of the afternoon. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all us, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And our hymn of praise this afternoon is number 37, Let All Things Now Living. come to our prayer of confession. We are blessed with a love so great we are given grace, and with that we can acknowledge our sins. Let us join our voices. God of mercy and renewal, we seek to cling tight to you, but still we shudder with anxiety and fear. Savagery of war, division and anger, a rise in tyranny, all seek to dislodge our hearts, souls, and minds from you. We find it hard not to rage and judge and withhold forgiveness. We find it hard to love everyone. Now, Lord, we bring our personal confessions to you. And now together, please forgive us our weakness of faith and for those times we let the world divert us from your will, when we lose sight of our purpose to be a blessing to your world. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. There are times when we all feel hard to accept, and yet God accepts us freely. Times when we know we're not lovable and yet God loves us freely. And times when we know we don't deserve to be forgiven and God forgives us freely. This is one of those times. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ, I get to share with you this good news. In Jesus, we are all forgiven. Amen. And take a moment and pass the peace of Christ. Peace be with you all. Arlene, Michelle, and Jeff,
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Our first reading this afternoon is Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. This is the greatest commandment. Hear the word of God. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher. Which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The word of God. Thanks be God. That first reading is just one of my favorite passages. Uh, it, it's a program or it's a teaching that we could focus on for a year if we wanted to. Um, maybe someday we'll want to. Uh, it's not bad and it fits with these days of kindness that you're talking about too. Uh, it's also, it's not a, a novel thing. It's not a new thing that Jesus is saying there. It has its roots in the oldest uh, pages of the Old Testament and of the Hebrew teachings. And I think that's one of the things that we'll talk about uh, t today. Uh, like a lot of people, I had a little crisis at midlife. Now, I didn't buy a sports car or get a facelift. I'm from Los Angeles. That's what people do down there. Uh, but <clears throat> I thought that was funny when I wrote it, actually. Um, at the time, I was a, a fundraiser for a large Christian organization. I was uh, managing a team of fundraisers that covered the 13 Western United States. And um, I was working and I was attending a church. I was, you know, I was still ordained as a pastor, but functioning as a church member, I was involved. I taught Bible studies. I uh, helped with service projects and preached every so often. And this crisis kind of hit me all of a sudden. Uh, what was it that I was supposed to be doing with my life? How was I supposed to be living? And uh, maybe most importantly, how, what did God want from me? It was this passage that you just uh, heard Tom read that, that, that really spoke to me and gave me uh, some, some comfort in that moment of crisis. It gave me some clarity. It was that passage from Matthew that helped me understand what my life was supposed to be about. It's right there in the way that Jesus answers that question that was meant to trip him up. Right. If you if you know the context of that story, it's it's Jesus being questioned by one group of of Jewish scholars, the Sadducees. And when they can't they can't crack him, they hand it over to the Pharisees. And it's a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, one of the expert uh, lawyers uh, in the faith uh, that tried to press Jesus with this question about the best commandment and the most important commandment. But it's in that passage and in Jesus' answer that I understood what everybody, all Christians, are meant to uh, have as their response to God's call. It was liberating. Now, it might sound like that was a constraining thing to finally figure out exactly what I was supposed to be doing with my life. But I found that liberating in that moment. And it had nothing to do with my own other calling as a pastor. 
This one was for everyone, for everyone. The point of that is that Jesus says that everything hangs on these two commandments. Everything hangs on those two commandments. When he says the law and the prophets, that was Jewish code in the first century for everything, all the scriptures, everything from Genesis right up to Malachi in our order of things. And so it's, it means everything that you read that we call Holy Scripture was meant to point to these two commandments. It's one of the things that we do uh, in our church at First Press that we do with our kids is every children's message ends with love God, love people, and do things. That's really, that, if our kids know anything from Sunday school, that's it. That's what we want it to be. And what I came to in that moment of crisis was that this was our calling as Christians, all of us as Christians. This is the thing we're called to do. Uh, over the, the next few Sundays at First Press, we're going to be talking about the idea of calling. So when I roll through here in June, I'll probably still be in that conversation with them. We're talking about what it means to be called to something. And the idea of having a Christian calling usually gets focused on a tiny percentage of people in the church, right? Ministers and missionaries. We think they're the ones that are called and the rest of us are absolved, right? We're outside that, that bullseye of what God's trying to rope people into. But in the Bible, the most important callings are for everyone. Literally, the most important things that we're called to in the Bible are for everyone, not for certain special people. Jesus quotes two of them in that passage uh, in his answer about the question about the law. He's quoting two different passages from Leviticus. Love God and love your neighbor. He combines those two and they become the greatest commandment. And so those aren't specialty callings. Those are callings that are meant for everyone. They're not meant for some people and not for others. No one's absolved from the call to love God and love our neighbors. The most important invitations to this new way of living, those are for all of us. And here's the point of all that. As Christian people, we're called to live and live our own lives, whatever it is that we're doing, with Jesus as a model. With the way that Jesus interacted with people as a model. Uh, with the ways that he accepted people, the ways that he fought against or argued against injustice, the way that he called out church leaders when they turned church, when they had turned church into a place of imprisonment and not a place of release and joy. We're called to share that love of God uh, the same way we learn about it in Jesus. We're called to share that with the entire world, with all nations. And that's not something new that Jesus invents in Matthew 22. Even, uh, even before that, even before there was a Jesus uh, walking the earth, God called someone to be the extension of his love and blessing to the whole entire world. And that's whose story we're going to look at today. Our text this morning is from uh, the 12th chapter of Genesis uh, verses 1 through 5. This is uh, known as the call of Abram. The Lord, and in this passage, the Lord there means Yahweh. Yahweh said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all the possessions they had accumulated and all the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. God's word for us this morning. So Abram, 
He's quite a character, and at some point here, I'm going to morph into calling him Abraham because that's how we know him. It's a few more chapters before God changes his name. Actually, that's an interesting part of the story because Abram in Hebrew means exalted father, but Abraham means father of multitudes. That, that small change to our, to our English-speaking ears, that's a small tweak to his name, but in Hebrew, it, me it makes a huge difference. So that happens eventually. But the Abram that God encounters here is a, a wealthy man with lots of livestock and a large group of people who depended on him. Uh, these were nomadic people. Uh, they lived off the land and off of the, the, uh, the herds that they kept with them. So they had meat. They sort of foraged for the rest. And there's, these people are still around Israel-Palestine, by the way. It, I can remember driving down the highway between Jerusalem and Jericho, uh, A, thinking about the Good Samaritan story, because that's where the guy gets beat up, right, on that same road. But looking off, I saw clusters of tents, and our guide told us those were Bedouin nomads still living off the desert in uh, Israel-Palestine. Abram's travels were limited to an area around Haran, uh, which is not a city that exists anymore, but on top of it is another city in southern Turkey near the Syrian border. So in you know, for all of you who look at maps, and I trust all of you will consult your maps uh, later on today, uh, this is uh, in the southern part of Turkey, just across the border from northern Syria. Uh, it was a trading center back then. It was a, a trading center's figure pretty large in uh, the Bible stories because those are places where ideas intersect. So even places in the New Testament like Corinth and other places, they're port cities. They're places where people bring ideas from other places and they, get, they sort of get tested and sharpened and refined in their interaction uh, with other faiths. No one really knows the, the, the context of how Abram was called to faith. But from the text, we can kind of glean that God calls Abram because Abram was seeking after the one true God. And that was a different sort of thing in an era, in a, in a place, and a time when uh, there were gods for everything, right? God could be either be in everything or everything may, may have had its own God. So there would be a God of the harvest and a God of music and a God of... Abram was somebody who was seeking after the, a, a one God. And that kind of, you know, the technical term, right, is monotheism. That was new. That's, that's, that's the innovation that the Hebrew people bring to Western culture uh, during those, uh, those days. And Abram uh, was somebody who was seeking after God and worshiping this one true God. And so he's been doing that, and so God comes to him to make a deal, to make a promise to him. But it's, uh, I like the idea of calling it a deal instead. He's, he's in a negotiation a little bit with Abram. And if you read more of Abraham's story going forward, you know that this is not the last time God and Abraham have a negotiation. There's a fair amount of haggling between God and Abraham. It's kind of a rich part of his story. But as part of the deal in our text, God changes his name to Abraham. Like I said, that happens in a few more chapters. Abraham builds on that deal with God, and he becomes the patriarch for the Hebrew people. The promise that God makes with Abraham is a special kind of promise called a covenant. Now, we talk about covenants a lot. They're a rich part of our language, uh, especially as Presbyterians. We, uh, Lots of things are sort of... Uh, in, in deep, dark blue, written as covenants. Even our, our worship book has the word covenant all over the place in it. Not every tradition does that. That's, a, that's one of the distinctives of being uh, part of the Reformed tradition and Presbyterian. But it, a covenant is a certain kind of agreement where both parties agree to something, and both parties agree to receive something from the other side. It's... it's a, Usually, in a political sense, it was an emperor or a king uh, conquering a territory and then entering into a covenant of protection with them. So let's say, I'll protect you. You'll be obedient to me, and I'll protect you. And in the old form of that, there would be a preamble and there would be historical references. I did this great thing for you. I spared you when I conquered your country. And so now you should be obedient to me. And there were witnesses. There are all these provisions 
of an ancient covenant. And in the covenants we see in the Old Testament especially, they use these, um, these elements of secular covenants in the ways that God enters into agreements with his people. So God enters into this agreement with Abraham and uh, uses treaty language that was already out there. And so uh, I, I made up one. I made up a, a sample model composite covenant that we might see in different parts of the Bible. We would see different parts of this in different covenants. But you would see something that says, I am the Lord your God. I delivered you from slavery. That's the history part. Uh, I will bless you and keep you if you worship me only. That's the exchange. And then here are some stone tablets. <laughs> because there's usually a provision in the secular covenants that we're going to write this down so that anyone can read it who wants to see it. And then I added here, have your priests read them to you. Um, and then I will bless you if you keep my commandments. But if you don't, I will take you from the land or deliver you to an enemy or send a famine to you. All three of those happen in the Old Testament as a part of God's continuing covenant relationship with his people. And so in that simple, goofy, made up example, you have all of the elements of a, of a covenant, the way that people understood them in ancient times. A preamble, some history, details about what was being offered and what was accept, uh, expected. Uh, plans for writing the covenant so that people could read it and a list of witnesses and then blessings and curses, right? I'll bless you if you keep this. You're cursed if you don't. In our passage today, there's a streamlined version of this. Uh, we see Yahweh came to Abraham, Abram and said, trust me. That's really what he's saying. And he's, he's, building on Abram's search for a one God that's over all the other gods and all the other places. He says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And then second, here's what I'll do for you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And then he says, God says, I won't leave you alone. I will bless those who bless you and curse anyone who curses you. And then finally, God gets to what he's after. He says, here's what I'm after. Here's what I really want from you. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Oftentimes we read the part about the promise to God's people, especially about the land. And that land is contested right today. Uh, but we forget that that promise of land came with an expectation of faithfulness and being a blessing to neighbors. That's my favorite part right at the end. God instructing Abraham and his descendants to be a blessing to everyone, to everyone, everywhere, every place in the world. And so I get myself into trouble a couple times a year by saying what I'm about to say. I think the Bible really begins in Genesis 12. That doesn't mean I've torn the pages out of Genesis 1 through 11 from my Bible, but it's in Genesis 12 that the conversation and the relationship between God and God's people that we are still in today at 2.30 on a Sunday here in this place, that conversation begins in Genesis 12, in that first expression of covenant. We see it in simple terms almost every week in uh, the ways that we, uh, in our church, sum up our messages, love God, love other people, and then do things about it. All of that begins in the conversation that God has with Abraham in Genesis 12. And so this covenant with Abraham is a big deal. I, it's a big deal. It's an important part of the biblical story because it continues right up through Jesus and right up to where we are today. Um, it's, it sets the course for Judaism, for Islam, and then ultimately for Christianity. And then after Pentecost, this agreement in Genesis 12 between God and this one person sets the course for all of human history. It's a very big deal. 
So what does that mean for us? I think as we look at how to apply this, it's, it's joined together with that first reading from Matthew 22. It's Jesus summing up the law and the prophets into love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Not the easiest things to do. It's the greatest commandment, but it's also the hardest commandment. Nobody'd read it if you put that heading in it though. The greatest commandment makes it sound like, well, we really ought to read this. If it said the hardest commandment, you'd probably skip over it. So would I. But God's covenant that he makes in Genesis 12 and continues through the ministry of Jesus and then continues through the Holy Spirit today, uh, it came with provisions. It came with conditions. Trust him and be good with your neighbors. God's calling on our lives is the same. It's conditional. Now, bear me out here. God's love might be unconditional. God's grace might be unconditional. But this calling has conditions to it. To really live into the full blessing of the calling given to Abram, that lived out through Jesus and the disciples and the apostles, and then all the way through to us. That calling, that calling's not unconditional. Living in such a way that blesses our neighbors and even our enemies, that's not a piece of optional equipment. And what I always say when I talk about options is, those of us old enough to remember buying cars where so many different things were options, right? I remember when an automatic transmission was an option. You paid extra for an automatic transmission. You paid extra for air conditioning. And I grew up in Southern California. My first new car did not have air conditioning because I couldn't come up with the extra 500 bucks. So this is not an optional piece of equipment. This is not one of those things we can say, nah, you know, I might do that and I might not. Uh, it, that part's important. It, it's what identifies us as being true followers of Jesus and not pretenders. And God knows there's a lot of pretenders out there right now on all sides, some of them louder than others. Be a blessing to all people. That's our uniform. That's what marks us as being followers of Jesus. Love God and love everyone else too. That is the answer to God's call. And so when I originally wrote this, it was to lead into communion. And what I would say about that is that we receive these gifts from the Lord's table, right? And we talk about them every week as blessings for the journey, right? Ways of nourishing ourselves uh, for the journey of faith, for giving us a sense of remembering who Jesus was and being aware of who Jesus is and, and struggling uh, when we have to, to believe who Jesus promises to be in the future. All of those things are blessings for us. In light of what we've heard from Genesis 12 and also from Matthew 22, what are we meant to do with our blessings? Share them with the rest of the world. That's how this ties to these days of kindness for Safe Harbor and the ways that you're, you're trying to do random acts of kindness. What you're really doing is sharing the blessings of God that you've received, just like God covenanted with Abraham. And so we take this blessing, we take the blessings that we've received and we share it with our, en with our neighbors and with our friends and even with our enemies, because that's what it means to live our lives with Jesus as our model. That's what God is starting to talk about when he enters into that covenant with Abraham. It's what God demonstrates in the life and ministry of Jesus. It's what God through the Holy Spirit empowers each one of us to do, both individually and as gathered communities of faith. That's our calling. That's what God wants from us. And it's a very big deal. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the ways that you invite us into your mission for the ways that you call us to uh, live as if Jesus were our model. We thank you for Abraham and his faith, 
for that new faith in one God who was in all and over all, and for the ways that you invited him to trust you, but also invited him to share that blessing with the rest of the world. May we do the same today and always. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. As we come now to times prayers for the people, let us sit in a moment of silence or two as we raise up to the Lord all of those things that we carry deeply in our hearts, whether they are concerns or joys or issues that we are striving with. So, great Holy Divine, we come to you now as a corporate people with our prayers. Please hear them. God of love, all that humankind has feared or hoped, hoped for, and done is sustained in you and your presence. As we pray, we suspend a pretense of power, our aims of control and our sense of self as we offer the very heart of our being to your holiness. We trust. In Christ we are loved, and all that we are and pray is within your grace. Now we uplift those in pain, those who struggle, for hopes that have been crushed, those in mourning, lives that have been shattered, futures that are clouded. Lord, we ask that you give strength to honesty and empower civility. Help us to bear the work of decency, ministering to need, bearing your light at all times, in all things. We ask blessing for the peacemakers and for justice. Lord, bring mercy upon us. Make us to give it. Lord, speak to our hearts that we may know your will. Put your wisdom in our minds. 
Put a love in us that connects us to your presence and enable us to endure this world and know that we are of your kingdom and we are here to serve. Lord, we seek the courage to love everyone. There is much to heal, fix, and forgive. Let us be about it. This is our time to keep the faith. And now we seal these prayers with the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our response is number 710. We are an offering. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with so much, individually and collectively, as a culture, as a nation, as a world. We bring a little of that blessing back to you today, dear Lord. Guide us, direct us as we share let us share with the understanding that this is a blessing that has come from you. This is part of our requirement to love you and follow you. Direct us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Be seated. Let me invite you again as you go out this week to figure out some way to share the blessing of Christ that you've received with someone else. That's it. That's our part of the deal. Go out and live the covenant. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us each and every day. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.